just because you play the right notes, rhythms, and it's quantified and tuned pretty well, that doesn't make it music. That makes it sound, organized sound. Music is when you touch the listener's life, you touch their life, you touch their heart, you you create a, a response in the listener. And as a musician, we should be always looking for those opportunities to, to do that. And, and it's it's a difference between any one. Um, why do we own seven different versions of Beethoven eight? Because there are really literally more than seven different interpretations of Beethoven uh, eight. And it's the same in, in band music. That why, why do we listen to a recording and try and copy it when we have, we have our own ideas that will musically enhance what the composer gave us. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now on to my next guest, Thomas Leslie. Hi, Tom. How are you? I am well. Thanks for the call this morning. Absolutely. And thank you for joining me on the show. I'm really happy to, uh, to talk to you and to have you share your story with my listeners. Well, I'm honored to be a part of it. I appreciate that. So, Tom, can you introduce yourself and tell, tell the audience who you are? Yeah, I, I can do that. Uh, my name, again, is Thomas Leslie. I am the director of wind band studies and conductor of the UNLV Wind Orchestra uh, here in beautiful Las Vegas, hot Las Vegas. And I have been here at this university since 1985 when I was hired away from teaching high school. Wow. And, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, I'm, I'm in my high school band room and the phone rings and my student aide asks, uh, who it is. And they, and they said, uh, it's president Maxson. And she said, Mr. Leslie, Mr. Leslie, come here. It's, it's president Maxson. And I said, that can't be the president right now is Reagan. So she hands me the phone and, and literally it's the president of the new president of UNLV who's calling to invite me to imply, uh, to apply to be uh, the, the band director. He's trying to build a program and uh, he calls me directly. So that's how it all started. Wow. That's an, I can't wait to get to that story when we get there. It's interesting in that uh, he, he was brand new to, new to the university and knew he wanted a real and a real viable uh, and competitive band program. And, and when I arrived on campus, it that quite didn't quite exist like that. That's interesting. I have um, a few ties to the Las Vegas area, mainly because my college roommate was a trumpet player. We were both trumpet players at Chico State, and he was uh, from Las Vegas, and he's still there now. And he studied with Walt Blanton as a high school student. Uh, Walt Blanton was a great teacher and a great friend. Yeah. And uh, he had a terrific trumpet studio. Yeah, yeah. His teacher and our, the teacher up in Chico, where I went to undergraduate, were good friends. Yeah. He, he Walt, Walt was a real gentleman. And what I loved about Walt, uh, he was just real with everybody. And he could play on both sides of the horns. He could do jazz and he could do legit and he did them equally well. So, so Tom, I want to kind of dive back into that because I have a lot of questions about the relationship between Las Vegas and the university as far as how, you know, the music making in Vegas is at a very high level. Um, but before we do all that, can we talk about your background and can you, can you talk about like how you got into music, how you got your start? Yeah, certainly. I uh, grew up in a musical household. My mother was a professional uh, musician. She was a singer. And uh, in in her younger days and around World War II, she won a, a national talent search. 
And uh, the prize, first prize was to go to Hollywood and to do cabaret scenes in some old black and white movies, which she did do. And when uh, my father came along and married her, uh, that pretty much ended that kind of her career. And then it was just an occasional performance here and there in a club or singing in, in a local opera or singing in a local musical. The, the, the point being that, that uh, because she, she was a great musician uh, and her mother had been a professor at the American Conservatory in Chicago back in the early part of the, uh, part of the 20th century, she wanted to have music as a part of my life. So I, at like age four, I started studying piano. And then when I was in the second grade, um, I took up the French horn. My sister came home one day with her friend from high school band and she was a French horn player. She brought her horn over and, and took it out and I got to play on it. And, and actually it was a good fit. So I became uh, more of a horn player than a pianist. That's for sure. And my mom would drive me from my hometown of Muscatine, Iowa. She would drive me up to the University of Iowa, which was about an hour drive every week so that I could study with a teacher at the university. And that went on from about fourth or fifth grade all the way through high school. And uh, I, I, I loved playing. You know, I, was, I loved music. I listened to all sorts of music. But when I was young, it was all jazz and classical. And um, I, toward the beginning of my senior year, my, my mother said to me, well, I know that you're going to go to Iowa. And um, I just don't know what you're going to study. And I said, well, I don't think there's I, – I thought it was going to all, – all along, I thought it was going to be music. And she says, well, you know, I don't know if that's, you know, what, what you'll want to do with your life. And I said, what do you mean? And she says, well, you won't make very much money. And I said, well, I, I'm, I'll be fine. You know, I, I love music. There's, there's nothing else that I really care about. And she said, well, I thought you would be a really good dentist. And <laughs> I said, well, you should have told me that uh, before last year I got a C plus in biology. <laughs> <laughs> so that <laughs> that ended that discussion, and I went to the University of Iowa. I had a wonderful high school band director uh, in Muscatine. His name was Charles Creeb, who had come home from World War II, like so many other good musicians that played in, in the Army bands all over the European and Asian theaters. He came uh, home and then became a, a, a teacher and then uh, the director of my high school band. He'd been there for years before I got there. He also was my first horn teacher, and uh, he he's my hero, still my hero today. He knew almost everything. You could ask him a question, and he there was nothing he couldn't tell you. If you had, you could take him out on tangents, and he could give you uh, the correct answer. So um, he was a delight to work with, and I learned I learned horn from him first, and it was on his horn that I played. And so finally, uh, when it came time to, to uh, go to the University of Iowa, I, was, I decided I would go as a music major. I had ironically been the drum major of my high school band, and the only reason that I chose to do that was because in those days, horn players played E-flat alto horns, and I, I didn't want to have anything to do with that. So I asked my band director, what, you know, how do I avoid that? And he said, well, there's only one position on the field that doesn't play, and that's the drum major. You can try out for drum major. So I did, and and then continued that at, at Iowa. So I, I never really had to play on a football field, which was, I mean, it was great for my, my embouchure and, and – uh, <laughs> And I and I enjoyed the you know the drum major part. The Big Ten drum majors have a really special tradition, and so it was it was a lot of fun. And during that time, I of course played in the Iowa uh, Symphony Orchestra, which was great. And I played in the Iowa Symphony Band, and and of course chamber music. And and uh, four years later, I graduated uh, with a music ed degree, and I knew that I wanted to get my master's degree right away. I didn't want to go out and teach and then find myself in three or four years without the finances or, or, you know, have other responsibilities that I wouldn't be able to go back to school. So uh, during all this time in high school and college, I was teaching at the, the Smith Walbridge 
drum major camp, which was the original drum major camp. I mean, that's where it all got started. And I, I was invited to teach there. And so I really enjoyed that because I, I honed in teaching skills and, you know, and, and group management and group dynamic and, and how to build the emotion and the, and the positivity within a group. I learned that all uh, from Smith Walbridge. And at Smith Walbridge was uh, the, the famous Gary Smith, who um, many people might remember as the associate director of bands at the University of Illinois, had the great Marching Illini band. But at the time, he was teaching at Indiana State University in Terre Haute, which was an excellent music ed school. Um, originally, it was a teacher's college. So I, I went to Indiana State and, uh, with an assistantship with Gary. I was there one year and a summer finished my master's degree and signed my first teaching con- contract in uh, Bettendorf, Iowa, which was close to my hometown. And uh, that was what a great way for me to start off in my career. I wasn't in charge of the program. I was actually the second assistant I taught marching band. I taught the freshman concert band, but the freshman concert band had like 100 students in it. It was huge. It was a big program. And uh, I got I got to do the marching band and the freshman band. And I did the jazz band. And then I taught lessons, trumpet and horn lessons. So it was a wonderful way to start a teaching career. I was there two years. And then um, uh, I'm, I'm actually at Smith Wallage camp in the summertime. And, and I get a call that, that uh, Greenwood Community High School in Greenwood, Indiana, was uh, losing their band director. Um, actually, he was going to Indiana State University to take Gary's position because Gary was moving on to Illinois. So I interviewed for the job and became the band director at Greenwood High School uh, for three years. And, and that was an incredible chance to, to learn because that was a state champion band before I got there. So uh, it was... It was learn or die, you know, and fortunately, those those students were wonderful. I mean, when students can can pull you aside and teach you, here's the here are the things that we do really well. And here's how we get things done. And here's why we're successful. And so you build on what they're already doing rather than trying to change them. And um, I learned so much uh, from those students. Uh, they were so gracious to me. And I stayed three years. But after th- three years of competing almost every weekend, whether it's marching band or jazz band or a concert band or uh, indoor guard or, or uh, indoor drum line. It was just every weekend. It was, it was something. And, and uh, I just felt a little bit burned out after three years. And I, I was looking at the rest of my career, I mean, which, which I knew was going to be a fairly long career. And I didn't think I could maintain that kind of uh, um, a rigorous competitive schedule. Plus, I, as much as I, I, I like, I'm competitive and like to compete. I realized that the tail was wagging the dog, and uh, I, I wanted to work to live rather than live to work. And uh, so I took a, a high school job in Tucson, Arizona. My parents had, had retired and moved out there, and um, we built it to. A really highly competitive level, and in their third year, and this is a band that the first day I was there, there were 47 people that showed up for band camp. You know, I mean, it was it had gone through it had gone through a lot, and um, so for, from 47 people the first year to two years later, marching the Rose Parade with 188, having just won the Fiesta Bowl National Pageant of Bands, and uh, it, it was. It was like uh, Camelot at Palo Verde High School. I mean, you just, it was so much fun working with the students and they they wanted to be good. One of the first questions they asked me when I first arrived at the school was, will we ever have to be laughed at again? And I said, we will never be laughed at again, I promise. And so um, that's, and then... That was six years there, and and I found myself at UNLV. So you were you got the call while you were in Tucson. Yes, yeah, it was uh, it was late winter, early spring, and uh, I got a call from the president, and and um, I, I just didn't know that 
that was how they did it, which I found out later. It's not really how it was done. Uh-huh. But he, he said that, I said, why are you calling me? I don't, I don't have a doctor. And he said, oh, I don't care about that. I said, he said, I've called eight or nine people all throughout the West and ask them to suggest names to me of people that could build a program at UNLV. And he said, every one of them had said your name. And, um, I, I, you know, I got goosebumps and I was really honored that, that, you know, he was going out of his way to consider me. So I came to campus and interviewed and, and uh, eventually got the job, not realizing that he wanted me to build a program that really didn't exist in a, in a, a full university program. I mean, competitively with, with anything. I mean, I, it was, he really wanted me to build it from the ground up. Mm-hmm. So he, he became a, a big supporter while uh, we were both on campus together. Those were the years when UNLV won the national basketball championship and J- Jerry Tarkanian, uh, Actually, Jerry was one of my interviewers when I came up to campus to, to oh, interview. Wow. Yeah. And, and this is a true story. He asked me, he said, Mr. Leslie, so I just have one question for you. And I said, yes, sir. He said, do you own a set of golf clubs or a camper? <laughs> I kind of laughed and he said, it's not funny. I wouldn't hire an assistant coach that had golf clubs or campers, so I'm not going to. Uh, support a band director who has either one of those things. <laughs> so I said, it's, it's, it's great. I'm a, I'm kind of a workaholic. I love my job and, and I, uh, I don't need a camper or golf club. So I don't know if that was any help or reason why I got the job, but I got the job. And then that was July of 1985 when, it, when we started. So it's, it's been, it's been a long run 30. I think I just finished my 34th year at UNLV. I have a ton of questions from that, from your story. Is that all right if I dig into some of this? Oh, no, go ahead. So I want, I guess I want to start with you being a high school drum major. Um, cause when I, when I've, a lot of my guests on the show have been drum majors in high school and then in college and, and that leadership and then your time at Smith Walbridge, I'm wondering if maybe we can talk about leadership a little bit and what, what we can do with our students to help sort of foster this leadership that leads them on to great careers like like you and others, whether it's in music or otherwise. Yeah, great. Uh, when I was at Smith Walbridge, there was, there's, and there still is, uh, a great book that Gary Smith wrote. And there was a, a fairly large section in this book about leadership. And I remember that he had a chart with descriptors of, uh, of leadership qualities. I mean, I can't, I can't tell you what they all were, but you, you were to look at this chart, decide where you fell percentage wise into this, into that column. And then you, you, you continued until you had done the whole survey. And, and so you could see, well, it says gracious. Well, I don't, I don't know if I'm all that gracious or it, you, you can see that, that it says, uh, um, uh, decision-making capabilities and well, I'm not really, you know, all that great. So you it could see at the end what your, what your own uh, perceived weaknesses were. And uh, I thought that that was, that really got to me as a high school kid. When I saw that, that, that a leader is all of these things and where do I fall into these categories? So I tried from that point on to, to follow through with things where I could improve my score uh, by you know how I how I handled situations and or how I was judged in situations, and um, I, I really found that uh, a leader who is can be many things, but a leader is someone who can um, create a positive si- situation and success with those that are p- following him developing success, developing a camaraderie and uh, having group goals. And so my teaching style developed from that in that I always involved my students in the process. I just didn't spit out knowledge to them or spit out something that I wanted them to do. I would involve them in the process of why are we doing this and what will, what will be created from this? 
And uh, I saw instantly that students who were involved in the process and, and who are interactive within a given process will uh, become more aggressive in their, in their learning and performance. And, uh, and I've used that pretty much as a hallmark my whole time. When I was actually a drum major in high school, fortunately, uh, Mr. Creed took care of most matters uh, with the band, uh, whether, whether it be musical or marching or discipline, and I just was kind of a showman. But uh, as I taught camp for years after this at Smith Walbridge, um, it was a big, big part of me to instill to the students that came. And they, uh, this camp was huge, and they came from all over America and uh, several uh, countries worldwide. And, and uh, so it was a big responsibility because the things that you say to these people are going to matter to them, either positively or negatively. So it's important that you are following a positive uh, track that, that uh, will benefit them throughout their life, whether it's about drum majoring or band. Um, it's about uh living life the way that you best bring out the best in yourself and others and, uh, and, and helping to create success in others. So that was my, my, my drum major experience. When I was at Iowa, again, I didn't, wasn't really involved in running the band or, uh, much. I was mo mostly just a, a, a showpiece. And, um, and so, but, but again, uh, t while teaching camp, uh, at drum major camp, my uh, I was really developing my my teaching strategies for what was to come later. One of the things, one of the themes that emerges from this show as I talk to people, you know, especially when we th I think about your uh, story of the high school in Tucson where you built from forty seven in just a few years. You know, this idea of building a program, and to me, it, it comes down to building community and building excellence, and those are the two things that we need to focus on. Well, I think they go hand in hand. I mean, you can't do one without the other, I believe. And, and so it, it, uh, if, if you truly want to build something that's meaningful, that's going to last, that's going to make an, an impact on people that you're working with, then you have to consider the person, the people, you have to know that you're, you're teaching the person before you're teaching the music. And so you have to have the kind of relationship with that person where, uh, you know, it's just unfettered learning. They just go and they, they benefit by the things that you say and do. So, yeah, I, when you build a program that, that even, uh, is, is more intensive in that building the program takes time. And uh, I heard uh, something the other day which struck me. It was a comment that somebody made that that um, s small successes come over a period of time, but something of great impact happens all at once. And um, I, I kind of agree with that in that I spent six years in Tucson building that program and probably could have spent another six years to, to continue to build it had I not come to UNLV. But having done it, I, I knew that I, I had a chance of building a program at UNLV. In fact, when I, when I took the job in Tucson, I needed to know, was I capable of building something? Because I had just inherited a state champion band, and I was originally a second bander, a second assistant in a, in a large high school band program. That's why I took that, that job in, in Tucson, because I, I felt like this is, this is important for me to learn about myself as I move forward. And so, Tom, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how you built that program in Tucson. I think a lot of my listeners kind of want to hear a little bit about the secret sauce or maybe the little magic that maybe they can use in their programs. Well, interestingly enough, when I took that job, I had gone down on spring break to visit my parents. And they happened to know one of the assistant superintendents who said that five band directors were retiring at the same time. There were only nine high school bands in Tucson at the time, and five of those directors were retiring, so there were j five jobs open. And I went to each school and and just informally interviewed and had taken a film with me of my band at Greenwood, and, and in each program, the principal offered me the job. And so I, I came back home to uh, Indianapolis um, thinking about what 
what is it that uh, is going to pull me to, toward one of these jobs? And should I really be leaving Greenwood after only three years? But I really love the weather in Tucson, I'll tell you. And in those <laughs> days, there were some bad winters uh, in the Midwest in those days. And um, so uh, when I drove my car into a ditch in a snowstorm one day, that helped me make my final decision. And so uh, I, I went to Tucson and I chose the program that needed me the most. And uh, they had been through five band directors in the last couple of years because their director had retired two, two years prior. And there were several directors, several people that came in to direct that band, but they all uh, didn't last. It was just a mess. Mm. So, so it was, you know, before I got there, it was probably a very nicely respected high school band program by, by a elder statesman band director. And, um, but it had fallen on hard times and really hard times. So when I went in, um, I again took took one of my my films from Indiana, and in, on the first day of uh, of band camp, as I said, forty seven people showed up. Um, I showed them this film and I told them that this is their this is what they can do too. There's no difference between them and uh, students anywhere else in the country that they could, they, could, they could realize their dreams if they wanted to be good. So they asked me the, those questions, will we ever ha- be laughed at again? And I said, why are you asking that question? Well, last year at a crosstown rival, the audience laughed at us during our halftime presentation. Um, and they said, can we have discipline? And I thought, that's, that's interesting, that's a first that's the first time I've ever heard anything like that. Can we have discipline? I said, yeah, you'll have discipline, but it'll be peer dis- discipline. It'll come from within the group. And they asked me, how long will you be here? Cause they had just been through five band directors. And I said, I'll, I make you this promise. I'll be here longer than any of you. And, um, we had a couple of days of, uh, marching fundamentals in, in the early part of the, of the camp week. And, uh, because I had been teaching drum major camp, I had those fundamentals um, well within my reach, the ability to teach and clean. And, and uh, so they were getting uh, small successes. And I was making sure that every time that they did something with excellent precision or they gave a verbal response to a, to a command, uh, uh, every time that there was something good that happened, I, I just told them, that was really good, guys. I mean, this is this is really, you're really going to be something if you continue to learn like this. And all of a sudden students started coming into the band room that hadn't showed up on the first day. And so we, we built ourselves up to 76. I think we had 76 total performers uh, in that marching band. And um, they won superiors at uh, every uh, festival that fall. And um, they were, kind of the talk of the state for, uh, for such an early point in time. They didn't really have much, uh, of a concert band. It was, it was, I mean, really not almost non-existent. So I started teaching more music fundamentals, reading, uh, fundamentals of instrument playing and, and sound concepts of, of people's individual tones and uh, eventually they became a pretty good concert band that first year. And uh, so it was fun watching them succeed and especially having them know it. Because I've always believed that, you know, people, when people say, oh, a band isn't fun for me or a band isn't fun. Well, may, maybe not because band is hard work. But the fun of being, band is, uh, of being in band is being in a good band and knowing it. Yep, and that's when, and that's when it's fun, and so uh, we just did that with a concert band, and we did the same thing with the, with the jazz band, and that's not my forte. I mean, I had listened to a lot of jazz, but I was a French horn player, and so uh, it it was a challenge for me, but nonetheless, um, I brought in lots of people to to uh, to run clinics and and kind of show me how to elevate my teaching chops with the jazz band. And that's pretty much what I did that first year at Palo Verde. There were, there were, there was a marching band that turned into the concert band, and then there was a jazz band. And then the rest of the day, 
I could do whatever I wanted. It was an incredible, I mean, situation for, in terms of your time requirement. And uh, little successes turned into bigger successes. Uh, they they took the the, uh, the top spot at the next year at the at the Arizona um, marching uh, festival, the state marching festival. They were they had the high score and and they did from that point on for the rest of the time that that we were together in Tucson. And once, you know, once success and, uh, becomes kind of a good sickness, you know, the desire to be successful, then it just kind of takes care of itself. And you just, you, you stay out of the way a little bit and you, and you, you support them and guide them when they need additional guidance. And that's in essence, that's just what happened for, for six years. And I was really proud of that band, but I was more proud to work with them because they allowed me to do everything that I had to do to help make them great. So there's, I have a couple of questions that, that came up in there. So you mentioned that you chose the, the, the program that needed you the most and that you mentioned that there had been several directors before you that might scare some folks. Cause usually there's something behind that. And I'm wondering, you know, how, how you approach that. Well, you know, I, that's the reason I just that I took that program was I had to know was I capable of taking something that was you know down on hard times could I do it because if I couldn't do it then what was I doing in this profession so it was just making logical decisions all along the way and really caring and supporting the students having having tough standards during rehearsal and then after rehearsal, being there for them to make sure that I was there to support them. Because high school is a tough time for, for, for kids in, in many ways. And um, so if, if you avail yourself to, to them when they're in need, you know, and they need guidance or they need, they need advice or, you know, they just need some to know that somebody really cares about them. Then that was for me. That was easy to do because they were such wonderful kids. So it it made it it made it easy for for me to be that way. And uh, I think that uh, to be a good teacher, in many ways, you have to be a good person first. So uh, con- concentrate on on your own on the, on your own uh, ideas and your own concepts and your own ability to care about people, and then good things will follow. Yeah, it's it, in many ways, it's why I took the job teaching beginners, because I had never done that. And I had this little thing inside of me that said, I need to teach beginners, or I'll never know, you know, I'll go to my grave, <laughs> not having done that and, and missing a, <laughs> a huge part of what it means to be a music teacher. Well, I tell you, when I, when I student taught, when I, when I was at Iowa, uh, part of the semester was with uh, a high school band, Iowa City West High School band that was extraordinarily good. But part of it was teaching in the elementary school where they still began their students in, in uh, fourth grade. And that was so much harder for me. It was so much harder that I, I decided that I didn't ever really want that to be part of my daily teaching responsibilities when I got done with student teaching. And, and from that point on, I never really had to work with um, beginners at the young level. I knew I wasn't very good at it. And uh, although I did start beginners, I had a beginning band program at, in, in Tucson at Palo Verde High School, but they were, you know, 16 years old, 15, 16, yeah, 17 sure. years old. So, so, um, it was, it was, uh, more conducive for, for me to teach them than, than the youngsters. I mean, that, to me, that is, as I said before, that, that is a special gift. If you, uh, are an elementary or middle school band director and you're achieving success with your students, that means you're a special teacher. Yeah. Any thoughts about how we work with our feeder schools or maybe to, with the directors with whom we're feeding? Yeah, I, I, I've told my, my music ed students here at UNLV for years. Um, I, we have conversations about what they are looking for in their, in their future. And I would ask questions like, what do you think the most important things that will affect your the, the quality of your program when you when you start teaching and almost none of them at that time ha- had the word feeder in their mind and I did because um, 
I experienced it both ways. At Bettendorf, it was a great feeder program. At Greenwood, it was a superb feeder program. In Tucson, it was just almost non-existent. Uh, and so I realized that without good feeders, you're going to be you're going to be pulling rabbits out of the hat, and, and you're going to be smoke smoke and mirrors until you can develop your own good players. And it, it was a school that was in a socioeconomic area where students couldn't study privately. So when they began the band program, the band parents program, uh, one of the initiatives was to raise money for uh, either private instruction or scholarships for uh, teaching or taking private lessons or uh, bringing in people to do master classes uh, every week which is the, the route that I, that I chose because I could get more uh, for the resources and the students would benefit by that. So um, if you don't have a theater program, you still have to do it somehow. And I, I, I knew the difference between good feeders and non-existent feeders. And non-existent feeders means you work so much harder. So, Tom, I want to talk about Las Vegas and the university um, so you mentioned that you, we talked a little bit about your interview and that you got that phone call and you mentioned that the, the university president had a vision and that you guys, or the, I'm sorry, let me say that again, cause that, you guys, so you mentioned that the university president had a vision and that, um, you sort of structured the program. Can you talk about what that was and how the program looks now? Well, at the time when I arrived, it was a very um, small marching band. Again, I mean, my first rehearsal at UNLD, they were, ironically, um, maybe 48 people that showed up. And um, and the, the wind ensemble only met during the spring semester. So fall, it was marching band. Spring, it was wind ensemble. And uh, the jazz band w- was not my responsibility because we have a jazz department in our in our school of music, and have always had a jazz department, and it's covered by some really great teachers. So my focus was um, uh, the marching band and the, and the wind ensemble, and developing good music ed students who would go out into hopefully our school district here in Las Vegas and develop some strong programs and send students to you. And I mean, that was my, my original goal. I didn't realize when I first got to UNLV, how difficult and how much time it would take to, to really build the program. I mean, with a high school band that in Tucson, we felt like in three years, we, we were, we were definitely on our way, but in in the college, it was just, there are just so many other variables that you don't have when you're, when you're teaching in the public schools. And um, one would be recruit recruitment of students. And, and to do that, you have to have a scholarship base and, or you have to have a product that, that, uh, that uh, allows for students to come and pay, pay on their own nickel. So um, all of that had to be addressed, building a scholarship base um, going out and working with the local with the local bands in Las Vegas, so people would know what I was about, and and then putting you know putting it on the stage, making sure that I had a a, a good performance. So when when band directors or students from high school came around to, to hear the uh, then wind ensemble, they uh, they it would be something that would be competitive for them and they would, they would want to, to do when they came to college took 10 years, Mark. I mean, it, it took 10 years before we really ever had any, what I consider big success. We were successful in many ways along the, along the way, but um, getting everybody to be on board with the same philosophy and, and the same goals and the same commitment to the to uh, the daily progress and work that took a long time to instill that and um so by about 1994 things were really starting to move in the right direction the marching band had grown uh, significantly uh so much that i i was able to to uh, assign my associate director of the marching band and then i spent uh, all my living waking time 
with now a wind ensemble that, that met both fall and spring semesters. And uh, then in 1994, we played a CBD and a convention in Reno. It was a double convent, double uh, region convention, West region and Northwest region. So it was huge. And we played a, a concert at that, uh, at that um, convention. And th- the actual performance was stunning. I mean, in, in, in many ways that, in fact, I don't know if you remember the uh, the Eric Whitaker piece, Ghost Train. Mm-hmm, sure. That was the that was the night of the of the premiere, was in was in Reno, and uh, it was second on the concert, and it had it got a standing ovation, and uh, I and I had uh, my buddy Eric Marienthal with us, and we played a Dana Wilson, a saxophone concerto, and Eric just came in and blew the doors down, and uh, it just. It was a great concert, and it was we were off and running. We turned that live recording into our first CD, and um, I knew that recruitment was still a big issue at UNLV. But the problem was uh, there was no way that I could get tour money to take the the Wind Symphony at that time out on tour. So the the most economic way to do it was actually make CDs and make them available to band directors all over the country. And at the time we had a booth at at the Midwest band uh, uh, convention in Chicago, and we would just literally give CDs away. And that went on for years. And we started making a CD almost every year after that. And we would, if you came by our booth at Midwest, you would get a free CD. And uh, so those things were all over the country and they were also all over the globe. And we started getting more and more attention. And as we got more attention, students started showing up uh, from from other areas, other states, you know, other countries. And uh, and so recruitment now was starting to, to perk along pretty well. And, and it all started from, I believe, uh, taking what existed and just patiently, every day, patiently, working and honing it into something that one can be proud of and then showing it off in a situation where they were showcased and then um, then the success was was evident and the students saw those successes and so it it became similar to the to the group in Tucson it it, it became um, they were feeding on success and they wanted more You mentioned Eric Whitaker, and I know Eric was a student at UNLV. Um, What other composers have you worked with, and and what's what's sort of the value of having composers working with your band? Uh, I, I'm my one of my biggest points in my career is to collaborate, collaborate with my own studio professors, collaborate with great musicians from other areas, and collaborate with composers. And, uh, so I've done that. I, I, I commissioned all of the, the, uh, composers that became a part of the BCM, uh, group that was Eric and, uh, Steve Bryant and, uh, that whole group. And, and I started commissioning works from them and they would come to campus and, and work with the group and, and, uh, those also those pieces went out on CDs and they were very popular. They were selling lots of music because of the recordings that we were making of their music. And uh, throughout the last, I think I've got um, close to 55 uh, commissions that I've done uh, since 1994, since Ghost Train. And some of them, most of them have been sole commissions, what we've done from UNLV. It's, it was a UNLV commission paid for and premiered by us. Several, I've, I've participated in several consortia to, uh, to um, have works written, a uh, few, few works by Maslanka. And um, I just always felt that it was important to give the students, give them a, a a really insightful look into the uh, the wind music world, so that when they went out, either as a player or as a teacher, they had been uh, they had been elevated by working with those kind of people in those specific situations. So I I really worked with with lots of composers. Uh, most recently, uh, I've 
led the commission with Bruce Broughton. Uh, he wrote a trombone concerto for Joe Alessi that we premiered in February and recorded in April. And it's a stunning piece because Bruce is a stunning, I mean, a stunning composer. And it's not bad having Joe Alessi stand on stage with you either. So there were so many uh, composers that I had the opportunity to work with. And, and right now I have commissions I have another commission uh, with Bruce Broughton to write a double concerto for Joe Alessi and Chris Martin, which he, he's begun work on. I've commissioned uh, a very famous jazz musician in L.A., Mitch Foreman, to write a double concerto for my buddy Eric Marienthal and John Patitucci. So that'll be kind of a third stream piece. Uh, and I, and I, love doing, I love doing those kinds of, of things just to prove that I can play jazz with the, with the, with others, and uh, I've commissioned um, a young composer in in our uh, composition program, Jorge Machang, to write a drum set concerto for Bernie Dressel from the Big Fat Band. And so, those those two those three things are going on, and uh, and there'll be more. The difficult thing with commissions is, of course, paying for them. And so you're limited at any one point in time on what you can do by what funds are available for you to use. So I had to really be careful and tiptoe through all of that over the years. And But yeah, we've got 55 or so uh, commissions that we've been responsible for in one way or another. Wow. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the, this having Bruce Broughton, who for those who my listeners who don't know, he's a film and television composer with some incredible credits. I mean, he's, oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the list of shows that he's written for is unbelievable. And so have you found that there's any, does, does being in Las Vegas help? Well, I think that's really the best situation. I mean, that's a great question because I, I think that I'm just a facilitator and enabler. I think that students truly come to UNLV because there's work. There's so many working musicians in, in Las Vegas and there's work for them when, when they come to town and when they're, when they're suitably ready musically and technically uh, they'll start by, by subbing in uh, any of these showrooms or any of these lounges. Um, and uh, so we tend to get players to UNLV who are really coming to play. I mean, they're not, they're interested in music ed, but they really, what they want to do with their life is perform. And this is one of a few cities in America where uh, they can get their start and have a nice career while they're, while they're getting their start. So, yeah, I think it's, it's what really helped uh, us develop uh, our program through, through recruitment. And like, as I said before, we have a strong jazz uh, a component in our school of music and uh, the orchestra is strong and the wind orchestra now I think is just as they've, they're the best that they've ever been. And they're mostly made up of people again, that come to town and want to, they want to play. And we have uh, many students that play in the Las Vegas Philharmonic. There's lots of chamber music going on around town. There are lots of shows on the strip and off the strip where people are being hired to perform and, and uh, support the show. And so it, it's really a, really a good situation. The, 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 the street, we call it, uh, can bring a lot of negativity uh, to, I mean, the, the connotation of coming to Las Vegas to study music, people, some parents roll their eyes uh, with that. But, but once uh, parents come to campus with their son or daughter and they see the campus and they, uh, hear what our students are doing. I think it, it, um, it's a much easier sell than it probably could have been. But I have lots of students now that have graduated uh, from UNLV who are playing uh, with all the, all the heavy entertainers that are in town right now, uh, whether it be Celine Dion or you know, Lady Gaga is in town with a residency and uh, Elton John over the years. And so these students are making great livings uh, doing what they, they love to do. 
So I think it's, it's definitely been a help for us. If, if this school would have been somewhere else without that kind of a viable players scene, um, I think I'd still be struggling to, 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 to recruit and to bring it along. Interesting. Yeah. Like I said, I have a friend who's in, in Las Vegas and, you know, that's something that we've talked about over the years, you know, a place where musicians can actually make a living is there, that it's becoming harder and harder as we well know. Absolutely. And they're cobbling it together these days. I mean, I have our, our trombone uh, professor, uh, Nathan Tenoye, uh, plays for um, Bet and plays for, for uh, uh, Lady Gaga and plays for, he plays all the heavies. He's also an arranger and he writes a lot of their arrangements. And uh, he teaches trombone and jazz for us at the university. So he's pulling his income from se- several different sources and he and he's and he does quite well and he's not alone in that we've sent several people out that um are you know they're they're the they're the they're the anchor on the strip for for you know brass and woodwind players percussionists all right tom this has been really interesting are you ready to do the the final questions the big philosophical questions fire away We've touched on a few of these topics in our conversation, but I always ask these questions at the end of all my guests, guests, excuse me. And the first is, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? That's a, that's a great question and a very fine line. It is. Um, I think competition first is the, the use of competition to help, uh, advance a program, uh, it's um, a major responsibility of the person at the top. We all know that the person at the, at the, at the top determines uh, the goals and the, the means uh, to, to take a program forward. So it depends on, I think, the attitude of the, of the director first. If you're going to a contest and you're going to win, we all want to win. But if you're going specifically to win and that's your goal with the students, that means that if they're not first place, if they're second or 22nd, they didn't win. And in some ways that connotates in their mind, well, we must be uh, not very good or we're losers because we didn't win. So the attitude of going to a competition is, yes, you always want to go do your best and hopefully winning will be a byproduct of that but never putting a uh, competition in the mind of the student that, that to be successful, we have, we have to win. What we have to do is to go out and perform the best we've performed so far this season. And um, I think that is the focus and the main responsibility of the director when it, when it comes to competition, having a healthy attitude and, and then, Loving the students when they come off the field or come off the stage and congratulating them and, and uh, uh, letting them listen to their, their tapes after they come home from the festival and um, to keep it balanced. So when it becomes unhealthy is when it, it becomes about competition and people walk away from shows or concerts or festivals and they walk away. Uh, with a with a negative image of what they've just done, I mean, that, and so success breeds success, and negativity breeds negativity. And once that gets started in a program, it's like cancer. You know, negativity can 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 take over a whole program and can ruin the experience for the, for the students. So again, balancing competition, not competing too much. Uh, not burning out students. I, I, I hate to see students go to any university, uh, regardless of their major, and not benefit by their their playing uh, capabilities because they're burned out, uh, whether they're music majors or not. I, it, I think that uh, we can easily burn our students out with uh, over-competing and over-rehearsing and et cetera, et cetera. And everybody knows the dangers of that. Yeah. That's a, that's a question that over the, you know, I, I often think maybe I won't ask that anymore, but it, it, I just think it's one of the more relevant things that, that I talk about in each of these episodes. Cause I think it's something every band director deals with every day. Well, I, I went into my career uh, without really thinking about competitions. When I taught my first job in Bettendorf, 
we didn't really do any competitions, but when I got to Greenwood, that's what we did. And, um, and I know that those students had won in prior years and I knew that they really wanted to continue doing that. And it became, uh, um, somewhat contentious for me because it, it dominated all of our lives. Um, and they did well, but, uh, I just, I couldn't see a 45 year career, uh, um, doing, doing that week in and week out. So, um, when I went to Tucson, yes, we competed and we wanted to win. And many times we did, um, but it wasn't the main focus of what we were about. And what we were about was in, enjoying uh, music with each other and getting better day by day and knowing the differences and hearing the differences. And, and so that those differences were leading to their success in the band room and outside the band room. So for me, that's more of what it became. And so when I became a college director, it's, uh, talking to my music ed students, trying to answer the same question that you asked me just a few minutes ago and trying to give them a balanced attitude toward how they can proceed in their career while competing. Um, that became uh, an important part of my job, giving them uh, hopefully the information where they could make really great decisions about the kinds of festivals and, and competitions they went to and how they went about them. All right, Tom. So this is sound, sounds like something you mentioned that when, with the question with Jerry Tarkanian and the golf clubs, but I'm going to ask, how have you managed to find a work-life balance in your career? Well, I, I, again, I, I believe that I work to live that, um, I love my work. I really love my students. I, I, they're the greatest. These students are, you know, they're just so wonderful to work with. And uh, maybe it's because I'm old and have gray hair. You know, they treat me like I'm their grandfather. But um, it, I enjoy that about work. People ask me when you're going to retire. Well, I'm, I'm having so much fun right now. I, I, I'm in my 40, 50 year of teaching and and I don't want to stop. I love it. I love these students. And so um, for me, life, when you leave the building at the end of a day and uh, the drive home for me is beautiful. I, I live on the east side of the Las Vegas Valley up on some foothills and I drive home toward those foothills and the light comes from the other side of the valley at that time of day and so the colors of the mountains are beautiful and i take time every day when i drive home to notice that because it makes me so happy by the time i get home um i've my my work day is over and now it's my life with my my wonderful wife and uh, of course i i never stop thinking of music uh, when i'm watching a movie i'm so focused on the soundtrack or, or, or concerts, live concerts on TV. But um, I don't try, I don't allow my, my work life to control my, the real part of my life, the reason that I'm really living. And I, I would suggest that to all young band directors that you, uh, you, keep it in, you keep it in balance because it, it can hurt you. It can hurt you emotionally. It can hurt you physically. I've seen band directors burn out because they just, they had to do so much so often that after a while, they just didn't want to do it anymore. And I never wanted to let that happen to me because it was the only thing that I ever loved. I couldn't be a dentist, didn't really want to be a dentist, but I, I loved music. I miss playing. I think playing would enrich my life, but I, I don't have I don't have the time, but, uh, uh, definitely I work, I work to live and I believe that that's a great approach. All right. So this is a big question and it is, what are the challenges facing music education and how can we best meet them? Well, that's an interesting question, but I think that question is somewhat regional. It's a little bit different in, in, in different areas of the country. 
Right now in our school district in Las Vegas, which is Clark County School District, it's the fifth largest district in the country. Uh, when I first got to town, there were eight or nine high schools in Las Vegas. Now there's over 40. And um, so the challenge for the for music and arts in any school district is a, a pretty serious challenge. So far, um, Clark County has taken an avid interest in promoting music in the schools and arts. And I think many principals uh, of of high schools and middle schools have seen the benefits of having a strong music program and what it brings about in the students who are in that program and the humanity that it brings to the rest of the school. And so it's, we're very, we could be supported, I think even better than we are, but I, if, if, it, what, if we weren't able to do that, I'd be, I'd be happy with where we are because there's, there's band orchestra and choir in almost every school high school and middle school in Las Vegas and some really good programs while, while we're talking about it. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be the same way everywhere, but, I, but it is scary uh, when you see programs cutting their, their middle school band program or cutting their elementary general music program. This, th- that's scary because we, we need those arts and um, the arts would die if we cut music out in the schools, in, I, I believe. And um, we all know that music is an important part of everyone's life, whether they're a musician or not, and, and what it can bring to a person's life. So the challenges that, that uh, I think most school districts are facing is how to financially support their music program um, with the with the tax revenue that they're 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 provided by the state, it's the same in the state. You know, we we have a two year biennium. Every two years, the legislature meets and they decide the budget and the funding formulas. And then we get the news that we didn't we didn't get the funding that we had requested. And so then you have to start deciding where the cuts are going to take place. I think all of that is is kind of dangerous and. And unfortunate, but if you're able to to make it work, uh, maybe there'll be a day when there's more tax revenue available to public schools. All right, Tom. So if I could give you a time machine and set it to the day of your high school graduation, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I never thought of that, but um, I was from the get go, from the time I started playing horn back in the second, third grade. I just, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to actually be a professional player. So when I went to high school and I, and I got toward the, uh, the end of school and at graduation, I was the best player that I'd ever been. And I wanted to continue, uh, growing and learning and playing at a high level. So I never really thought about where it would take me. In fact, I didn't even know that I would become a a music educator. I thought I was going to be a horn player and and I didn't. So I didn't make too many rules for myself other than do what got you here, practice, have a great attitude about what you're doing, never go somewhere um, unprepared and, um, and always whenever you, you put, put the horn to your face always be the best that you can be at that moment. And I pretty much lived, tried to live by that, uh, those, those rules throughout my whole life. In fact, these days, you know, it's hard for band directors to take time to study their scores. Score study is uh, usually not during the workday. Score study usually is after school or at night. But I, I have time built into my schedule on days that I rehearse, especially I spend three hours with my scores in the morning and uh, because I never want to walk into rehearsal unprepared and to cheat my students because they always know <laughs> they, they always know where I'm not bringing, bringing everything to the, to the game that I should be bringing. And those are the, and then those are the rehearsals that don't go well and we lose that time. And time is a valuable resource. 
um, when you've got a performing group. So preparation and here, here's one other thing. I wish I could have told myself this when I was uh, graduated from high school. Learn music beyond the notes. It's Music is not um, sheet music. That's paper with ink. And playing the notes and the rhythms correctly does not necessarily make it music. It's how we, it's how we interpret what we see on the page and what we can bring to it to, to, to take it to a uniquely different level. And that interpretive aspect, I didn't realize when I was a senior in high school, I knew that when I practiced a, a Mozart concerto or a Strauss horn concerto, that there were things that I needed to do stylistically to make it be good. But I, I wish that I could have realized earlier in my life that there are opportunities uh, to take what the composer gives you and to elevate it by your own musical ideas. And, and I wish I would have known that to the day I left high school. I wish I would have known that before I left high school, actually. All right, Tom, this is a, another big question, I guess, for some, some people know right away, but the question is, if you had a choice, what would be the final work for wind ensemble that you would want to conduct and why? Oh my goodness. Um, well, uh, I, I have an affinity, uh, for a couple of pieces uh, that, that I, I love dearly because my, one of my mentors throughout my life was Dr. Harry Beejan, who had been at the University of Illinois and he and I were very close and he loved the uh, Schoenberg Opus 43A variations, uh, theme and variations. And when he performed it, he it, it didn't sound like anybody else's performance of it. He actually brought things to that piece that you wouldn't hear in another performance or in another recording. And um, many people are intimidated by that piece because it's difficult, but yet he he romanticized it because he saw that Schoenberg gave him uh, that license by how he had written it. So he added so much musical detail and uh, tension and relaxation to that, that you wouldn't hear in a standard performance. So I would do that and I would do what I could do with it to make it be the most musical performance. Um, so I, I love that piece. Um, I'm sure you hear the words Lincolnshire Posey a lot. I do. <laughs> uh, but uh, of course, I love that piece. I've done it you know, dozens of times in my career. And um, those, would, those would be two pieces that I, that I wouldn't mind doing on my, on my final concert. All right, Tom, is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Well, um, the release of the of our 21st CD, uh, the last 11 or 12 have been on Clavier uh, Music Productions, uh, which is a, a classical label that actually was interested in wind band music. And when we got the invitation to, to participate in recording for them and working with the masterful Bruce Leake as our engineer and editor, um, it became, those CDs became a labor of love. I love every one of them. We have a new one coming out. It's entitled Quaternity, Quaternity. Um, and that's the title track. And that's the Trombone Concerto by Broughton. Um, so that will be the first recording to become available of that piece. And Joe, uh, I know will be performing that piece all over the world before long. So I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to uh, suggest that folks give it a listen. I'm sure it'll be on Spotify and on iTunes, but there, there are other good pieces on that CD as well. And I think the group is playing pretty well. And um, that, that will probably be out in January or February of the next year. So, yeah, I would like love to promote that. Uh, also love to promote that our, our concert, uh, in February, the last Thursday in February, we'll feature Eric Marienthal, John Patitucci, and uh, and and Bernie Dressel on that with two premieres. Those are um, those are each half of the concert because they're they're going to be long pieces. 
um, one other thing that I uh, that I would like to promote, we'll be recording those and a new transcription of the, the entire Hanson Second Symphony, which is gorgeous music. I mean, romantic and gorgeous music. And I happen to love Howard Hanson. He was one of my high school band director's favorites and one of Dr. Beejan's favorites. And and I love that symphony. And there's no transcription of it available right now, but there will be soon. Tom, how can people get in touch with you? Well, I think I'm. Uh, it's pretty easy to reach me. We have a website. It's just simply unlvbands.com, www.unlvbands.com. And that will be uh, take you to our homepage. And then you can follow the link to my, to my email address. Or you can just reach me at thomas.leslie at unlv.edu. Um, and I look forward to any response or any, you know, anyone who want, wants to carry on a conversation about music or band, I'm very happy to do that. <laughs> and I appreciate our conversation today. Thank you so much. Yeah, my, my pleasure. If I can ever do anything for you, uh, please don't hesitate to let me know. It was great to talk to your audience and, uh, I'm available to, to, uh, answer questions or, uh, even listen to a director's situation um, because I know many directors, you know, they, they all function like I do. They, they're better when uh, they get advice and when they, when they hear it from someone else and it gives them more confidence that yes, we're doing it the way that we should be doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much. My pleasure. 